I'm Alana Terry and I am here with Jamie Hampton. We're going to be talking about prayer and miracles today and we have a really neat testimony from a family who went through just some heartbreaking circumstances but ended up having uh, just a really unique story to share with us. I am here today with my friends Robert and Stephanie McDonald, and I am just really excited to have them with me today. And um, it's not just because they're friends, it's because they actually have a really amazing story to share with you guys about how God worked through their prayers and really the prayers of a whole community to just do miraculous things in the life of their son, Jace. So, um, really, since Alana and I started this podcast, I've been wanting to have you guys on because every time we talk about the subjects that we want to bring to listeners, things that people would be excited about hearing, Jace's story is definitely the most clear picture of God doing a miracle that I've ever witnessed or been a part of. So, um, I wanted to just kind of start off with um, just kind of giving us a short synopsis of what happened on what I remember as Super Bowl Sunday, 2012. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, we had, uh, we had decided to go to a friend's house to have lunch after church. And, uh, you know, it was just a typical day with us. And I remember in the morning uh, playing with Jason on the swing set. And he, you remember when he hit his eye? Yeah. Huh. And, and uh, he had this little cut above his, his right eye. And, uh, you know, just kind of cleaning them up and stuff. And then we went to church. So <clears throat> we headed over there. We were going to have chili. And uh, we were hanging out. And the kids were playing in the backyard. And I remember the first thing when I went in the backyard, there was a pool. And I saw that the gate was closed, you know. I was like, well. And and locked. And, yeah, you know, it's like you when you, uh, as a parent, when you go somewhere, you always are kind of looking at the surroundings, to, you know be aware of the situations and threats that, you know, you could possibly be to your kids. So we actually, um, we're letting them play outside. And then my sister-in-law had called. So I took a phone call from her and, uh, about that time we were just about ready to eat. And then I finished the phone call and I came back in the house and I remember Stephanie telling me she couldn't find Jace. He, uh, he, he wasn't with the other kids in the backyard, and uh, we immediately, like, ran to the back door, and my friend had actually opened the pool gate to get a table to, for, to provide more seating on the patio, and we saw the pool gate was open, and we sprinted, you know, to the poolside, and my friend was in front of me, and he's, like, six 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 seven, so in the shallow as part of the pool he he bent down and reached to the bottom and picked jace up out of the water and uh i just remember seeing him uh holding him and he was just like a wet noodle and uh he started uh just pumping on his stomach trying to get the water out of his body and uh, so he did that, I don't know, probably like seven or eight compressions. And then we laid him down on the pool deck. And uh, at that point, um, I, was, I was looking into his eyes and his pupils were just massive. I couldn't see any color in his eyes. And he was cold and, and blue. And so we started by looking down his airway and there was just food you know, our kids are eaters and he was just devouring chips and salsa. So I was just pulling out vomitous by the handful, by the handful and just trying to clear his airway. And then when I was able to see that, um, there was a, a first shot, I gave, uh, two rescue breaths and then I started you know, 30 chest compressions, and I just continued to, uh, you know, 30 and 2, compress, making sure that when I was breathing, I could see his chest rise and fall, and uh, we just continued, continued, and it seemed like an eternity from the time that 
um, I could hear uh, Stephanie, the kids, and his wife on the phone with uh, EMS 911. And then finally, the first rescuers uh, arrived. It was a one. It was a volunteer um, EMT, and then uh, a standard <coughs> ALS unit, which would be a paramedic and a, a EMT. And um, I just continued working on him until they got set up. And then I transferred over CPR to the, um, the volunteer EMT. And then the other EMT was actually giving him breaths with a bag valve mask while the, the paramedic, I had moved down towards Jace's feet. And um, man, I was just holding his feet and praying. And then at that point, um, the, the paramedic, you know, told me just not to look up because he was having to drill into Jace's shin to start a main line so that they could, you know, push drugs into him. And uh, he started on his left shin first and it failed. So he had to uh, try on the right shin and he just can, you know, told me, just don't look up. I'm working on your son. And uh, so the right line worked. He got a main line into, it's called interosseous into the bone. And, uh, but at that time, you know, when I was holding his feet, I just kept saying, I know Jesus, your promises are true. You know, I just keep kept saying it over and over and in, 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 in my mind. And so, um, then from that point, uh, they continued giving rescue breaths and then an engine company arrived and there was like seven other uh, firefighter EMTs as well as another paramedic that showed up and they knew when, when the engine company came, it was like, we got to get this kid on a, on a gurney and we got to move now. So they loaded them in the ambulance and then they, they started down the driveway. Well, I remember we were standing out front in the driveway and my prayer was just, you know, God breathed life back into my son, and into our son, you know. And it wasn't like some just deep uh, prayer. It was just like, Lord, you know, this is from my heart. And uh, so we got into our Suburban and we started going down the driveway. And at the bottom of the driveway, the, uh, the ambulance was stopped and the flight team was already the helicopter was already down and the flight nurse paramedic and uh, the flight doc were, were in the ambulance and all of them. I mean, there were so many guys in the back of that ambulance and, you know, we're just continually praying and I'm wa looking through the back of the windows and uh, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but they were having a hard time intubating, trying to drop a, a, a tube down into his lungs and, uh, it was uh, Captain Joey Reese um, with Green Valley Fire Department that actually got, you know, an airway into his esophagus. Um, but from that point, they rolled him into the helicopter and that helicopter was gone. You know, um, I just, Stephanie and I in the suburban, it was, uh, you know, we were just praying the whole time. And, you know, I remember that she had called her dad and, uh, right as we were passing Sarita road, our pastor and associate pastor, and then another, another friend, they merged onto the freeway at the exact time. And we just saw, you know, each other's faces and they were right behind us, followed us in. Which meant a lot at the time. I mean, it was just so comforting having, you know, just seeing them there. And, uh, so we, we continued northbound and, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of conversation, but, you know, we, uh, our hearts were together praying for the same thing. And uh, I remember when we arrived at UMC, the first thing that met us there was a sheriff's deputy. And I'm just like, Lord, you know, is this the end? This person's here to tell me that my son is completely done and there's nothing, you know, but what happened is that when anything happens with, with a child, they are, they're always there. And then they, they're with us 
you know, uh, as a source of, uh, they try to be a source of comfort. They try to be, a, you know, just uh, a hand to, to help make sure that, uh, you know, uh, if media wants to be, you know, uh, involved. Because when a call like this goes out, it's public information. I mean, anybody, every, everything that's said over the airways can be picked up by any scanner, you know, people sitting at home. So we, we got led back into the emergency room by the sheriff's deputy into uh, a little room. And uh, my, my dad had actually met us at the hospital. And so my dad was there, um, both of our pastors, a, a friend that we had never met uh, up, in, up until that point. And then uh, Stephanie was there. Uh, so we were in the room and, uh, man, that's when I kind of, I, I, I lost it a little bit, you know. Just uh, the stress and stuff from, you know, what had just taken place really hit me. And uh, I was just crying, you know, and talking to my dad and, and uh, you know, holding on to Stephanie. And then this, uh, the ER, one of the ER residents came in and um, it was a, uh, a lady uh, and I had actually gone to high school with her. So I recognized her right away and she had recognized me too. And uh, she said that, you know, uh, right now, uh, Jason's with uh, Dr. Ree, a neurologist, and they're um, checking his brain matter. Um, one of the biggest concerns was they saw the mark on his right eye from what had happened in the morning. So they were just taking precautions, you know, and taking <coughs> pictures of his brain to see, you know, if he actually did hit his head and became unconscious, and that's how he ended up in the pool. Um, then uh, another, another, uh, a nurse came to the door and told, you know, Dr. Zukowski that um, we, uh, they were bringing him out of, uh, you know, checking his brain. And so we met him right there and he was just hooked up, intubated, you know, on ice, on ice packed in the ice. And, uh, Blue, swollen. Yeah. Just, just unrecognizable. Almost, almost to the uh, green looking. Um, and, uh, we went and we went up in the uh, the, the hospital elevator uh, to the the PICU, which would have been Diamond Six at UNC, and they rolled us into a room, and there was another team waiting for him there that was working on him, and uh, we met a resident doctor by the name of Aaron Leach, and he, you know, he he was working on Jason. And I remember like standing a little bit off of the bedside and uh, he said, I, I see purposeful movement. And then the, the actual attending doctor, which is the one who oversees these residents while they're doing their, their rotations through the different departments, he says, no, no. And uh, at that moment, I could just feel this like tension that was just building and not the tension on the behalf of you know, the resident doctor, but the attending doctor just like, no, you didn't. There's no, I mean, it's like no possible way that you saw what you just saw. And, um, you know, when he went, when, uh, when they just got him settled in the room and, and he was on uh, his machine and, and, uh, you know, everything that was happening was being done by technology, uh, on his behalf at that point. You know, breathing and breathing and living, and, you know, uh, Aaron Leach, he says, <laughs> he told me, and I remember he's like, hold on to that moment, you know, just hold on to that moment. And he knew that I heard what he said and I was looking over there at that moment. And he, and then he had left because, you know, he's on an entire floor of patients that, you know, they were looking for and stuff. And that, uh, that night, you know, our pastor, he lived with us, you know, and that was one of the, um, one of the greatest things is having him there. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I was seeing things from, uh, uh, a fleshly standpoint because, you know, my dad, he was in the medical field my whole life and I've been exposed to surgeries, being in surgery with him and different things. And, when you see someone in that capacity, it's like, you know, your eyes tell you one thing, but 
my and to be real honest, my faith was very small in that time, but my heart was yearning out for my son, pleading to my heavenly father. You know, and I I couldn't eat. Uh, I I could barely sleep and uh, it was it was like they say you know you got to take care of yourself you got to eat but I could not eat it was almost like you know because I'm created by God my my entire soul knew that I have to fast in this moment and continually keep my eyes focused on on God and you know then Monday comes around and He's completely reliant on the machine, and uh, we're just we're continually praying uh, for him. And you know, uh, we have people coming in and bringing us food, and our, our friends uh, that you know this took place at their house. They're living with us in the room, and you know they're praying with us. And we have an entire church praying, and uh, we have these people who have just jumped into action because. You know, the medical cost from, you know, the, the word go was just astronomical. And uh, we just, didn't have insurance. We didn't have any medical insurance at all. Um, and so, you know, we're going through this. And then um, Tuesday comes around. And uh, we're, we're there on Tuesday and nothing has changed. He's still packed in ice. He's still super bloated. Um, his belly was distended because of the amount of water that is actually, you know, he took on being underwater. There was one male nurse who was like really just straight with me. Um, a lot of the ladies were just, you could see the emotion that they were carrying because this little beautiful baby boy is in his bed, but the male nurse just straight with me he's like you know what he was down for a really long time and, and he, he was he was underwater you know we're, we're not real sure exactly how long but somewhere between you know five and ten minutes it wasn't some short period of time because we couldn't find him how and old was jace at this point i don't think we've we've mentioned that yet he was uh two years and two months yeah and um you know the, the period that brain, uh, irreversible brain damage starts happening is between four and six minutes. And then 10 minutes is like completely brain dead. You know, so when we're, when we're looking at what, what statistics and science is saying at this point is very grim. But, you know, we, from the get-go on Sunday night, we're playing Caleb in there in the hope that was just shared through the music during the day. And then the visitors during the day was tremendous. I stayed there at night and the Ronald McDonald house had set us up. I think Stephanie stayed there with me uh, the first night on Sunday night. And um, she was always kind of in and out, still tending to the other kids and, and stuff like that. And you could feel just the darkness of night and the enemy wanting to attack. But the hope that was through the music and Caleb and stuff was, was very helpful and uplifting. And uh, there was one night that uh, another friend of mine, Patrick, had stayed there overnight because they had a kid also that was in a different unit that was having some of his own issues. That Tuesday night when it came around and there was this, uh, there was a, a doctor that doesn't normally work there but had picked up a shift, came in and showed us his um, x-ray of his lungs. His lungs were completely saturated with water. And um, the entire x-ray was white. So you couldn't, you know, you, you just, you're seeing what this picture is telling us. And he's, he's telling us, you know, he's done. You, you know, you guys need to make decisions and start preparing, you know, to lay him to rest. And not only that, but there was a wonderful nurse that we're really still close friends with. And she had checked his eyes a dozen times and sent multiple nurses in there. And they actually were weeping when they were, would leave the, the room um, because when there's no pupillary response, that's a, a, a sign indicating that the brain is not working. Um, so we had left there that night and Stephanie was 
very angry and it wasn't a simple anger it was a righteous like you do not have the final say in this there's only one person that has the final say and that night um i remember my mother-in-law and one of my nieces staying in the room with jason stephanie and i had uh, went to stay the night at the ronald mcdonald house and i remember just crying myself to sleep and i woke up in the morning and i was crying and but I hear her, she's singing, you know, Stephanie is singing in the shower. You uh, know, she came and she's like, a miracle is going to happen today. You know, she's like, we got to go. And my wife is not one that's trying to rush out anywhere, you know. <laughs> it's like, I'm usually like, come on, we, we got to go somewhere. And she's like, you know, I barely have my socks on. And she's flying out the door. And we get to the hospital. And She's jumping out of the vehicle and I'm trying to catch her. She's running up there because she wants to tell these doctors, take this stuff off of my son, you know? So they started, um, yeah, that, that morning they started uh, reducing things and just taking all these interventions and removing things. And about, it was about uh, 11 o'clock in the morning that our pastor and the, um, uh, some uh, the, the elders, some of the elders of the church came, and uh, Pat, uh, Pete Lee was there, and, and and I remember Bryce Elliott, and they we anointed him with oil, and it wasn't just like you know the top of his head. They actually accidentally spilled the bottle of olive oil, so this kid is just completely like lathered in oil, and just laying hands upon him and praying, and the presence that was in that room was just not containable, man. And, and there was so much joy, you know, just in knowing that, you know, there's this community of believers and a wonderful God that we serve that is with us and we're not by ourselves. So the next thing that happens is that we're continually praying. And I remember my friend Bryce was there and Pastor Ben was there. And Bryce just kept praying and praying. And his legs, his legs started to move. Like he wanted to jump out of that bed and run down the hallway. So you know? right, while you were praying, that's when that happened? Yeah. And, you know, there was uh, um, a situation where, you know, we saw his actual eyelids open. And uh, he, uh, you know, it's like I just seen his eyelids open. And there was still even skeptics, you know, saying, no, you didn't. And then he, he grabbed my finger. You know, and he would hold on to it. And then he would, uh, uh, you know, we gave him a little car and he's holding on to the car. You know, so by Wednesday, we have um, we have all of this stuff that is just taking place. That's Jace. And, and just Hi, crazy. Jace. <laughs> and uh, it's just it's just crazy how. You know, from that moment that she told me a miracle is going to happen today, that all this stuff is taking place, and uh, uh, you know, he's he's moving, he's he's his eyes are responding. You know, there's life in this child. And, so what, uh, Stephanie? What was what was the thing that changed? Like, what was the thing? Did something happen to give you that assurance? Did God like? tell you directly or how did you make that shift uh, well you know it's it's kind of unexplainable but i'm i'm a journaler and so i was journaling that night at the ronald mcdonald house and um i was just praying and everything and you know praying to god and crying out to him and um i went to sleep and you know i slept very peacefully i just i just slept really well that night and i woke up and I was just filled with such peace, you know, I just, I, I don't really know how to explain it. I was just, I just felt such peace and such hope. And I just knew that a miracle was going to happen. I mean, there's no other way to explain it except to say that God just, he just, you know, told me, he just filled it inside of my mind and heart. And so that morning when I woke up, I just, I was singing praise and worship songs and I just. I just knew a miracle was going to happen. And, um, you know, we went to the hospital and I told them that I didn't understand how they were, um, 
how are they expecting him to, to wake up and move and have purposeful movement when they had him on such a strong paralytic? You know, they, they had him so he was in a medically induced coma. And so I wanted them to take that off, you know, lower that down. And um, they did. And also they, um, they had the machine doing all of the breathing for him. And what they would do is they would lower it um, kind of quickly and then Jace wouldn't be able to, you know, do the breathing, uh, to catch up to the machine. And so then he'd have to rely completely on the machine. Well, I wanted it to be lowered, you know, kind of slowly so that he could, you know, slowly build up his lungs and hopefully be pressing out some of this water, you know? Um, and I mean, you know, praise God it worked and, um, you know, it, it wasn't a slow process. There was a lot of bumps and stuff along the way. Jace had uh, MRSA in his nose. And uh, so we all had to wear gowns and gloves and masks and everything for a little while. And um, praise God, the MRSA wasn't, you know, localized into his body, just in his nose. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was an uphill battle because we we had a lot of medical staff that was just kind of against the whole thing, you know, just against us. And it, it just looked so bleak from them because they knew all the stats and, you know, they knew what they were talking about medically, but they didn't know who my God was and they didn't know what he was capable of and what he was going to do. And I did. And, you know, we both just knew that, God can do anything that he wants to do. And he did. So that's incredible. And are you, Robert, you told us a little bit about some of those prayers, really powerful stories of these prayers leading up to Jace's <laughs> healing. Can you guys think of any specific prayers that stood out to you or prayers of the community? I know I was part of a community prayer vigil that was just, I mean, I, it was powerful. Like you could feel the Holy Spirit there. I mean, I've never been a part of anything where I have felt it, it was outside in our little community and people from churches all over came and there were just a ton of people there. That's, that's what I remember about the prayers. Can you guys tell us about some of the prayers leading up to his healing? Um, you know, part of that, the prayer vigil that they had at the, the lake was, I believe it was that Wednesday night, you know, after um, some of these things that we saw were taking place. And, you know, we were, we were actually uh, on the phone. Pastor Ben was there and, uh, you know, we, we, we were hearing everything as it was happening right at that moment. And I remember my friend Ryan Brooks uh, and he was, you know, he was one of the guys that was openly praying like corporately among everybody. And, you know, I, 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 what comes to mind is, you know, when, when, uh, when, uh, when the apostles were in the upper, upper room and everybody was in one accord through that phone, even though we're sitting there bedside in Jason's room, I felt the arms of Christ just holding us. And there was no sorrow. It was, it was powerful. It was invigorating, you know, and, and just hearing the pleads of other believers in their hearts. And, you know, Jace is not their biological child, but they love him just as Christ loves us. You know, it was just an extension of the hand of Christ that was really comforting us in that moment. And, um, you know, uh, to talk about prayers um, that led up to his, his, his healing, you know, Dr. Aaron Leach, uh, ooh, we got a we got a letter from his mom. Actually, our pastor did an email, and and they shared. He shared it with us because he had asked the mother, "Is, it, is this okay if I share it with the family?" So she has sent an email to our pastor saying that at seven years old, this young man accepted Christ. He wanted to be a doctor since he was a little boy, and when he received Jace at the hospital, he laid hands on him and was praying for him. No, and I do I believe in medical care? Yes, but there's a hand that's greater than any human hand that's behind this medical care that gives uh, his creation the ability 
to help and, and to heal. And that's not on anybody's own power. It's on his power, you know? And it was just, it was so neat to hear, um, you know, this, this, this testimony of this mother speaking this way about their son because she understands the purpose that God has for her son. And he is, I mean, he's an awesome man of God. I actually returned one time because we thought Jace was having seizures. And he was in our room in the hospital. And he said, we're going to go before the Lord and we're going to lay hands on Jace. He is fine. And we're going to pray. And we have a doctor that's sitting in there praying, praying with us over our son. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. And, you know, going forward from Wednesday, um, when on Thursday, he finally just wakes wakes up and he's looking around and he mouths. He, you know, he's got this tube in and he has to be restrained because any two-year-old has to be restrained just about doing anything. But um, he's um, he's mouthing mama, you know, mama, because he sees Stephanie and he recognizes her. And, you know, then on, on Friday, Stephanie again is just charging in there and telling them, you got to take them off everything now. And uh, uh, to be real honest, um, I was very, very nervous because um, in 1997, my mom was on this same machine doing all the work for her. And, um, uh, you know, they extubated her. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they did express to us is that when we extubate your son, he will breathe like a fish out of water and we're going to have to put the tube back in. And when they said that, it took me right back to where my mom was extubated. I watched her breathe like a fish out of water, agonal, and watched her die. Yeah. And, you know, so that, that Saturday morning, we were nervous. Well, I should say I was nervous, but I had shared this information with Stephanie prior to going in there. and. Um, so we uh, we go in there and she tells him and it's time and then she's in the room with me and then she looks at me and she says I can't be in here right now I have to go stand in the hallway. So I'm I'm telling you I'm standing at the bottom of the bed and I almost wanted to go into the hallway but I knew that all right Lord I'm standing firm I'm not going to be moved I want to be obedient I'm going to be praying for my son through this process. And Kayla was playing. The There's a team of, of the, doctors. There are so I many mean, doctors everywhere. in this room because the crash card is there. I mean, they're ready to just like provide this, you know, they're to resuscitate the little guy, you know. And you know, it, I remember on Kayla, man, God's not dead, and it it said, "Let love explode and bring the dead to life." And that respiratory therapist Pulled removed that, that tube, and oh. he's sitting up there breathing, and he's, he's looking, looking all these doctors in the face. And they're just kind of, they're not moving. They're just observing. They're watching. And we had really good respiratory therapists um, during the whole time. But we also had a really good attending female doctor. And I turned to her and I said, can my wife pull him? And she says, he's fine. You can do whatever you want with him. And at that point, you know, we have the video where Stephanie is picking him up and he's just weeping and oh. she's holding him and they're crying together. And, you know, it was it was just amazing. Six days after this uh, drowning, you know, our son is alive and well, and you know, he's he's not he he has a little bit of recovery, you know, because he was down for a little little time. And uh, the biggest thing they said is that we need to get this kid to eat. And I said, well. I'm good at getting my kids to eat because I'm a good eater myself. So um, he wouldn't eat the hospital food, you know. So um, I actually went to the Ronald McDonald house and rounded up these um, griddles, electric griddles. And I was just, I just turned his room into a kitchen and I was cooking for him and shoving eggs. He would eat dozens of eggs, scrambled eggs, because he couldn't, he had to have something that was not less than the consistency of yogurt because they were worried about him aspirating. 
Well, so, they did. They did tell us that um, he shouldn't have anything, you know, uh, less thick than yogurt. But he he was still nursed at nighttime uh, at two, and so you know it, it was mostly a comfort thing, and it wasn't you know like a stay on there forever thing. It was just to go to sleep, and so. I remember that they told me that I couldn't do that. And I knew that that would bring Jace a lot of comfort. And so I did. And I, I mean, I, I didn't listen and I did, I did it. And <laughs> um, he, from then on, I mean, it was, it was just so good. I mean, he, uh, he's, they told us that he wasn't going to walk again. They told us he wasn't going to play again. They told us he wasn't going to eat normally again. You know, they told us all these things. And Jace, you know, he, he would do the physical therapy that they put him through. And they were, all of the therapists were like, you know, we thought he wasn't going to be able to do this. But he's fine. He's totally normal. He's like a total normal little boy. And, um, you know, they said he wasn't going to be able to run. Well, I remember very specifically, we put him down. To walk and he ran to me you know and it was just all these things they were saying he wasn't going to be able to do he did and I mean it was all all by the grace of God and all by his you know his perfect plan but um you know one of the things that I really wanted to say is at the bottom of the driveway you know Robert and I were sitting in a car and we both couldn't understand what was taking so long I mean it just felt like so long that we had to sit there and one of the things that we found out later was that Jace had actually died in in the ambulance he um you know he flatlined and they couldn't get him to breathe or anything and um so they were trying to stabilize him and bring him back and um in the in the helicopter when he arrived at UMC he wasn't alive um we heard that a lot of the doctors didn't even want to deal with him you know they just said he's done and that was it all except for Aaron Leach that uh said I'm gonna give this kid a chance and you know he believed in miracles because he had seen some firsthand and been a part of other miracles and so you know it is a miracle Jace was medically gone and he's alive and he's fine I mean he, he runs around he's a he's a crazy little boy and it's it's just it's you know God is good. That's, that's all. And I I also want to say you know I don't I think some people get too technical with prayers and they think that there's a formula you know certain words special things that they have to say to get God to to do what they want and um it's it's a heart cry you know um when when I saw Jace from far away. All that I prayed was, Lord, give him life. Let him live. You know, let him be okay. It wasn't some theologically deep, you know, thing. It was just pure and simple. And I knew that God could. You know, God can do anything. I just prayed that he would. And so, um, you know, we, we can't understand the plans of God. Sometimes, you know, God chooses to heal and sometimes he doesn't. Um, but I'm so thankful that he did with Jace. And I'm so thankful that we get to share his story and give God the glory, praise, and honor that he deserves because, I mean, I'm so honored and blessed to be a part of this story. And I remember uh, it was uh, one week after... Um after we had arrived at the hospital. It was the following Sunday, which would have been February 12th, 2012. Um, and <clears throat> I remember <clears throat> Pastor Ben called from the pulpit at church, you know, receiving an update uh, to see, you know, when we were gonna be moved out of the NICU. And uh, I remember they, they began to pray that, you know, we would be moved. And at that very moment, transportation showed up in the room and, and uh, I remember I was interrupting the entire prayer at church saying, hey, man, we got to go. They're, they're moving him now, <laughs> you know? And, um, and, and, and then afterwards, when we got into a regular, you know, 
uh, room for pe pediatrics, uh, Ben had called and he said, you know, uh, seven people accepted Christ today because of Jason's story, you know, and then following this on, on, uh, on Facebook and, you know, hearing it throughout the community. And um, that night, uh, the resident doctor, Aaron Leach, comes down and uh, he's, he, he just got right to the point. He said, you know what, I'm really not here to say hello and stuff. I'm, I'm here to tell you that when your son arrived here at the hospital, he was dead. Your son is alive. He's a miracle, and you need to remind him of that. And uh, it was just amazing at that moment to have that information shared, you know. And he also had asked at that time, he said, Can, could I um, have a copy of your child's records? He's like, you know, I've experienced similar outcomes in these situations in my uh, residency here and you know now it's it, it's a case study that he's going to be going through and looking at from his medical perspective but above all you know the spiritual aspect that he um understands and uh you know so we did we 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 allowed him to have a copy of that and you know it's amazing because the last sentence of his file yeah. it says due to the miracle Miraculous. To the, the miraculous, miraculous healing yeah. of Jace McDonald. And it's, you know, it, it, the records can't even deny, you know, the, the, the hand of God and, and all of it. And, you know, we had a conversation with our pastor and he said, you know, if, if this, if, if, if Jace wouldn't have lived, you guys would have still been all right. And, and, he said, yeah, we would have still been all right. And then he said, but this is just truly awesome. You know, and that's truth. It is truth. Would, would we be, in all, be all right? Yes. But in, because God is going to take care of us, he does take care of us. But it's his purpose and his plan. And the word says that we're supposed to have faith with expectation and to come to his throne and to cast all of our burdens, all of our cares, not just for ourselves and our own families, but for the people that he's laying upon our hearts each day. And, you know, when we do that, does it, does it petitioning the father move? Him? Yes, because he's a loving father and cares for us deeply, each and every one of us. That's amazing. Well, that, and, and that leads me kind of into the last question that I wanted to ask you, which was, how have the lives of others been impacted by Jace's story, including Jace and including your own family? Well, I'll tell you, Jace, um, you know, he sits in church with us a lot. He doesn't like to always go to the kids' room. And so he'll sit down, and when the pastor is preaching and, you know, there's um, scripture verses up on the, on the board, Jace, Jace takes notes. He takes notes and he he's following right along and he's like, what did he say? What verse was that? You know, he he's very in, interested in it all. And, you know, he said a couple of times that he thinks he'd like to be a pastor um, and I think he'd be great at it. So um, he he's asked his teacher before if she believed in God. You know, he goes around. That's one of the first things he asks people. Do you believe in God? And uh, he likes to share his story. Uh uh, he, you know, he tells them what has happened to him and, um, you know, his purest heart's desire is for people to know God because he's seen God, he, you know, he's, he's seen what God can do. And, um, you know, as far as our, our other kids, they're definitely all, um, moved by the whole thing. And they, um, our two older girls were baptized shortly after, um, this, this whole thing with Jace had happened. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there was, we were in a, like a financial small group and I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was a, um, a lady um, at the time, Frances, um, that actually, you know, shared and said, you know, because of what you went through with Jace and how you shared it in your faith, um, it's 
really, you know, moved me and, and made my, my faith greater because of that and seeing how you guys, you know, allowed God navigate you, and guide you through this. Um, you know, the battalion chief for um, Green Valley Fire, now he's, he's the head of the entire department. But, you know, his guys, they were super concerned with Jace and every one of them had to actually go home after the call because it was very traumatic for them. So they had to bring in a whole new crew um, after the, the call and they would, they couldn't get past coming to the emergency department and they were calling upstairs and trying to get information about him and they weren't really getting clarifying information that they wanted. So they went to their chief and said, chief, we need you to go down there. You need to go up there and find out about this little boy. And, uh, you know, Chuck Wonder, he's, he's a Christian. And he came up and, you know, we were just sitting in there and spending time with him during this. And he began to weep because of the power and the presence that you could feel in that room, you know. And uh, it didn't happen just once. He came twice. And he's just like, it's unbelievable. The amount of joy and, and power that you can you can feel in here, you know, that you, you just felt this hedge, this con, complete hedge of protection inside that room. And, you know, when you entered it, you could feel it. When you exited it, you felt it almost leaving you, you know, as you walked down the hallway. And, wow. You know, it's, it's just, it's awesome. We, there was tens of thousands of people praying for our, our Jace all over the world, missionaries, you know. We heard stories in Africa and, um, gosh, there was China. There was all kinds of people. You know, we heard these people were praying. And, I mean, how, it was just awesome to, to know people all over the world literally were lifting you up in prayer. And um, I, think, I think that's a big takeaway, too. You know, just really, I think some people say that they'll pray for people and then they don't. I think it's so important to just really, you know, come and fall at the feet of Jesus and really lift those people up with, you know, everything inside of you. And it's so important to gather together and pray. And prayer is just so important, you know, in, in everything. And that, that, you know, when you get people to share those personal <laughs> things or even with the, when you see something with your own eyes and you feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. You, you, you know, I've, I've just come across people, uh, clients, and uh, I just say, hey, can I pray for you right now? You know, because it's about being obedient to what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do. That's why we have that helper. That's why Jesus Christ released him when he was, you know, crucified, because that is our compass, that is our guide, that is, you know, what we have while we're here on this earth and uh, we need to be more open and sensitive to it. And that's one thing that has happened through this whole thing with me. I mean, I've become more sensitive to the spirit. Um, it, it has changed things in me. God is not done with me until he says, Hey, I'm taking you to glory right? to be with me. So. Faith expects miracles.